Coming up in today's newscast, millions of Israeli school children return to the classroom. A UN panel issues its first ever condemnation of the PA's hate speech curriculum. And Iranian judoka Saeed Mullahi reveals plans to escape Iran's shadow before the 2020 Olympics. Several anti-tank missiles have been fired into Israel from Lebanon. According to the IDF, the incident comes several hours after Israel reportedly fired artillery shells towards the contested Sheba farms along the Israeli-Lebanese border. The shells caused fires on the Lebanese side, but no injuries. The rocket fired from Lebanon into Israel allegedly fell near the Avivim community in the Galilee region of northern Israel. And Israeli civilians living within four kilometers of the Lebanese border have been advised to stay in their homes and open shelters when hearing alarms, to refrain from any activity near the border, and to avoid traveling on nearby roads. In related news, the war of words between Hezbollah chief Hassan Nasrallah and Israel continued over the weekend. As after Israel allegedly uh, struck Hezbollah's media office in Beirut last week, Nasrallah said that Israel must pay a price for its actions, presumably with rockets as we just saw hours ago. Foreign Minister Israel Katz dismissed Nasrallah's threats, though, calling him an Iranian puppet. And he also added that if Nasrallah continues espousing such rhetoric, he'll be credited not for helping Lebanon, but for destroying it. Well, not to be outdone, blue and white leader Benny Gantz chimed in, warning Nasrallah not to force Israel to attack and send Lebanon, quote, back to the Stone Age. But either way, the IDF is not taking a chance on whether Nasrallah is bluffing. Especially as on Saturday night, the Hezbollah terror group released a video saying an attack on the north is imminent. So the army announced that it will postpone a major drill for fear that there will be a harsh reprisal attack along Israel's northern border. And in addition, ground, air, and naval troops have all been given their marching orders to prepare for a heated northern conflict. Then meanwhile, troops stationed in the north already were told that they had to stay on base over the weekend and were denied Shabbat leave. It's quiet as you see now, but it's a little bit tense. Uh, the army is, uh, is ready to, uh, to reach, uh, react back if uh, Hezbollah will attack us. Uh, it's not nothing that uh, we're not used to it. Now, international forces were also reinforced over the weekend. The U.N. Security Council said it was renewing its UNIFIL peacekeeping mission in Lebanon for one more year because of this, quote, new conflict with Israel. That means the 10,000 UNIFIL members on the border will have to put off packing their bags for now, a move that Israel's ambassador to Israel, Dani Danon, applauded. He said keeping the troops there sends a clear message to the Lebanese government that Hezbollah must be restrained. But ultimately, Prime Minister Netanyahu believes that it's really Iran that is behind these rise in tensions. And as a result, he urges French President Emmanuel Macron to halt talks with the Islamic Republic in Tehran at this moment, which Macron is said to have started on the sidelines of the G7 summit with Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif. Well, today is a big day here in Israel. September has finally come around, and that roughly that means that roughly 2.3 million Israeli school children are heading back to class. Now, 170,000 of them are going for the first time. And 200,000 teachers and school employees have received them, even though Israel saw a tense summer leading up to the first day of school. A massive nationwide teacher strike was narrowly averted after the government pulled together a last-minute wage agreement. Now, not everything was protests and divisions, though. Prime Minister Netanyahu and Education Minister Rafi Peretz rang in the new school year with students in the city of El Kana. אני מאחל לכם שנת לימודים תוססת ומוצלחת. תחכימו, תלמדו. Now this year's numbers show just how much the Israeli population is growing. About 132,000 12th graders are entering their last year of school, while around 170,000 are starting their first. Which may be why more and more teachers are protesting their low salaries. One Israeli principal posted one of her workers' paychecks online, revealing the teacher's meager salary of 5,700 shekels per month. 5,700. That's a salary that many claim just isn't enough to survive on in Israel. 
Many teachers are reporting having to actually even work part-time in other jobs like waitressing to be able to afford their lives. And that's why the Israeli government has just reached a deal to help teachers get more sick days and a better pension plan. But some schools are still holding strikes, forcing over 38,000 students to remain home, with some uh, hosting student protests for an entirely different reason as well, to fight against deportations of foreign workers and their school-age children. Well, politics aside, President Reuven Rivlin has a message for Israeli school children. He's challenging them to learn not only about their subjects, but about each other. He wrote, we only, we only sometimes get the chance to become acquainted with and learn about another person's way of life. All right, so as a new school year begins, the Prime Minister, Finance Minister, and Education Minister have all come together to form a new program to support the children of Sterot and the Gaza-adjacent uh, areas. And while the details of the 10 million shekel program have yet to be finalized, residents and employees of the South will be the first to tell you how important such support can be. And here now to do just that is Adele Reimer, an English teacher, Nofei Chabsor, uh, and a teacher trainer in the Western Negev. All right, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So let's first begin by talking about the feeling on the ground right now as, as students begin the, the new school year in the Gaza area. Unfortunately, we've been living with this tense situation for the past 18 years or so. So our students are pretty used to it. And in fact, uh, our school is completely bombproof. Uh, the first totally bombproof school in the, in the country, if not in the world. Um, but it was tense today. I mean, I personally was not at school today. This is not a day that I teach in school. It's a day that I do teacher training. Um, but I know that school went on as usual and they tried and make it as jolly and fun as possible. It was exciting uh, to have the, the first school day, a uh, fun, memorable day. And even more significantly, right on the campus next door to us, three new schools opened up, three new great schools, which was a really big celebration for our region that all of the grade school children in the uh, Eshkol region are going to one school. So it was mm -hmm. a very festive day, uh, although all of the infrastructure, all of the security people, everybody, the teachers, sure. Everybody was on alert and and know what to do with the emergency. So speaking of that, you know, we've seen earlier today we had we had rockets coming in from Lebanon uh, in the yeah. north. What what are maybe some of the preparations for security that the students are undergoing for for any sort of uprising in the south? There's not really anything that's being done differently right now. Uh, We've been living with this any moment it could break out situation for at least the past year and a half. So nothing unusual or different happened today. But again, if something, God forbid, happens, the schools are safe. Everybody who lives within seven kilometers of the border has a safe room. And what typically happens is if there are rockets, our schools are closed. Right. So, and, so the question is, I mean, what do locals on the ground want from their leadership? You know, as we're going to the elections here, what, what are they hoping will change? I, I can only speak for myself. I'm in a citizens group, which is called Solidarity with the South. And we are hoping that there indeed, indeed will be a change, that, our, that we're, there will be a government that uh, looks after our security more, that's, that's more transparent in what they're planning. Um, and we're hoping things are going to change for the better. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Because we haven't had policy for a long time. So we need policy, good policy vis-a-vis -vis Gaza and good pos policy in general. All right. Well, we hope you get it. Uh, Adele Raymer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, in the meantime, as Israelis go back to hitting the books, for the first time in history, the United Nations Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or CERD, is sending its first ever condemnation to the Palestinians. They're saying they have to stop promoting and teaching anti-Israel hatred in the classroom. And the directive was published actually on Thursday, detailing concerns about anti-Israel and anti-Semitic hate speech in certain media outlets. 
quote, especially those controlled by Hamas, social media, public official statements, and school curricula and textbooks, all of which fuels hatred and may incite violence. A video recently released by NGO Monitor shows how children in the Gaza kindergarten's graduation ceremony reenact and kill and ki the kidnapping of Israelis. And the kids also use drones, they use body cams, military uniforms, um, and body armor with similar videos having been released in 2016 and 2017. NGO Monitor claims that what is worse is that the Swedish government sponsored a teaching training workshop at that school just a week before the event. And European support for UNRWA and other Palestinian education organizations who are accused of abuse is far from an isolated incident. Was well, for solutions, the CRD report goes on to suggest that Ramallah worked to better protect journalists, human rights activists, and political dissidents while removing impediments to democracy. And finally, while recognizing that Israel's involvement in the West Bank is an obstacle, CRD also recommends that the PA adopt comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation. And now joining us with more on the UN's landmark report regarding Palestinian school incitement, please welcome Executive Director of Honest Reporting, Daniel Pomerantz. Daniel, thank you so much for being with my us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. So my first question is, you know, what do you make of the CERD report? Is it is it too much? Is it lacking? Is it just it, right? It's absolutely unprecedented. We just we have not seen the United Nations take a strong position against incitement in Palestinian textbooks, government statements, social media, ever. And for anybody that cares about seeing us achieve peace in the Middle East. When you have an entire generation that's raised to believe that compromise is treason and that murder is admirable, you simply have to take a position on that or else you cannot be surprised when peace doesn't happen. Was this is, so you said this is unprecedented, but you know, why now? Why did the UN just make the choice uh, to publish a report like this, given its historical bias against Israel? Well, I don't know the inner workings. The report has been in existence for about a week, but hasn't been published until just the other day. Mm -hmm. But there certainly has been a great deal of lobbying behind the scenes to try and produce this. And, uh, and it's about time. I think really the, the real question is, why has a report like this been produced earlier? Right. right. So, okay, so do you believe that this report and other similar reports that have kind of come out, uh, you know, in the woodwork will have any real actual effect, any measurable effect in will the near future? Will they lead to change? Well, th these kind of reports from a committee at this level doesn't have what we would call teeth as such, sure. but it's important in terms of how the situation is perceived in the media and in the world. Now, at Honest Reporting, our job is to monitor the media, and so far our team has not been able to find a single article in any mainstream international news source uh, about this report, which is a problem. Because in 2016, for example, Palestinians were using social media to mount the knife intifada and to occur, encourage people to kill Jews and Israelis. And when Israel responded by working with the social media giants to shut down some of these channels, they were criticized in the international press for potentially interfering with free speech. Now that the UN has weighed in and made it clear that this isn't about free speech, but this is something that must be stopped. It's, incite to, it's incitement to violence. It's incitement to violence, and it's part of the story. And the new, news media really ought to be reporting it. All right, so what, I, I mean, I guess the real question here is what incentives Ramallah and, and Hamas really have to follow this protocol that is now, you know, this report that has now been released? Well, it's entirely possible that they could simply ignore it. Right. It's entirely possible that the UN could push uh, in ways that affect the level of international support for the Palestinian government, which is tremendously important for their activities. So in an, in t in an attenuated way, over time, this could have an effect on the amount of support that Palestinian leadership has in the world. I see. All right, and so, you know, one of my final questions, you know, what, what consequences are there for failure? Because you said that this report kind of lacks teeth, but is there maybe another government body or a UN body that, that might be backing it up? It's possible, theoretically, that it could go to a Security Council resolution, and the Security Council does have the authority to pass resolutions with the force of international law. But it's highly unlikely that something of this nature would get to that level. Right. Nonetheless, right. it's tremendously important because when you have students learning that 
Israel doesn't exist or that math problems are, are learned based on how many martyrs you, yeah. can, you can kill. Uh, that just doesn't lead us toward a peaceful situation. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us in the studio. My pleasure. Thanks for having this. me. All right. Israeli judoka Sagi Muki is still celebrating after taking home the gold last week at the judoka world championships in Tokyo, but his Iranian competitor Saeed Molai is having what some would call a tough week. The judo fighter is allegedly filing for asylum in Germany after he was pressured by Tehran to throw a match at last week's championships to avoid facing an Israeli opponent. And weekend reports suggest that Molai already actually arrived safely in Berlin after being whisked away with the help of the president of the International Judo Federation, Maurice Wiesel. In fact, the Iran International News Channel is calling Weiser the so-called mastermind behind the operation to fly Molael to Germany in order to, quote, harm Iran for Israel's sake. And they also claim that Weiser ordered a car with a German security guard to pick up the Iranian judoka and take him to the airport after allegedly discussing the plan with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. Iran's Olympic Committee is expected to file a complaint to the International Olympic Committee against the Judoka Federation's alleged actions. But Wiesel says the IJF intends on allowing Molay to compete in the future as a member of the team for international refugees in the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. And while Molay so far is denying reports of his asylum application, he has confirmed that he intends to compete at the Olympics under the international Olympic flag. In the past, Iran has forbidden its athletes from competing against Israelis. But back in May, the International Judo Federation claimed to have reached a deal with Iran to end that boycott. And that deal was later denied, though. In the past, Molay has uh, been accused of faking injuries and intentionally losing fights in the past to avoid uh, facing off against Israeli judoka Sagimuki. But last Thursday, it was reported that he would continue in the championships, even if he had to face off against the Israeli. According to reports, however, Iranian intelligence officials came both to his home in Iran and the judo arena in Tokyo to warn him against competing with Muki. And soon after, he threw his fight against the Belgian competitor Classe, or Kassé, and had he won that match, he would have faced off against Muki. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. Last year, an Iranian wrestler was banned for six months for deliberately throwing a match to avoid facing an Israeli opponent, too. In a diplomatic milestone, Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez arrived in Israel Saturday to inaugurate a new diplomatic office in Jerusalem. And now while Honduras hasn't officially decided to move its embassy to the Holy City, this move represents its recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Para nosotros es un paso muy importante. Estamos seguros que esto va a ser de un gran beneficio para Honduras. The Palestinians, of course, are not happy with this development, though, and they filed a complaint at the UN against the Central American country. They allege the move is an act of direct aggression and a blatant violation of international law and legitimacy. But the United States, on the other hand, has applauded the decision, a trend U.S. President Donald Trump seemed to have ignited back in 2017 when he decided to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and move the embassy in kind. And referring to that historic decision, United States Middle East envoy Jason Greenblatt tweeted that he welcomed Honduras's announcement. As for Hernandez, he landed on Saturday night and was greeted by tourism minister Yeriv Levine upon his arrival. And during his visit, aside from taking in the sights with his security team during one of his morning runs, Hernandez will meet with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and several high-profile business people. Meetings that are welcomed in the Jewish state, because as far as Israel is concerned, it sees this development as an important step towards the future move of the Honduran embassy to Jerusalem and the opening of the Israeli embassy in the Honduran capital too. And now, while Israelis start returning to their classrooms, let's take one more summer trip with ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh to a place that may just be the real-life Garden of Eden. Check it out. Ganesh Losha, located in the Lower Galilee, is believed by some to be the real-world location of the Garden of Eden. That's why Time Magazine crowned it one of the most beautiful parks in the world, and I'm here to check it out and see if it lives up to its legacy. The nature created the place and uh, people know about it maybe from the prehistory till today. The temperature of the spring water is at a 28 degrees Celsius or a warm 82 degrees Fahrenheit all year round. It's also healthy water because there is a lot of mineral that they collect from the ground. You can't drink it, but you can swim and enjoy it very much. You know, the Arabic and Jewish and old timer and newcomer, from uh, Russia immigrant, and of course tourists from all of the countries. That's why maybe half a million people come to visit in the year. 
just back from the Jewish Museum in New York and some other places. This collection is a very rare, maybe the only one in the Middle East. And after they took it to Italy and then it's back to here. From the Bible time, then the, till the Roman, you know, 2,000 years of Greek and Roman and Etruscan and other collections. Maybe the Italian or the Greek has thousand like that, but not more than this. The museum built on a biblical tell mount from King Solomon time, 3,000 years ago. Shlosha is also the location of Tel Amal, the first tower and stockade settlements which Jewish pioneers established back in the 1930s. Tel Amal was actually constructed in just one night, and they restored it to show the dining room, the kitchen, the living quarters, and kind of give a sense of the way of life of the settlers. So this is what a dining hall would look like back in the 1930s. It looks like a camp dining hall. So these are the living quarters where the settlers would have been sleeping. Let's go check this out. No, it doesn't want to do those. These are the living quarters. <laughs> Next time you complain to your parents that your room isn't big enough because you're sharing it with your sibling, take a look at this. All right, looks like fun, but moving on, get this. Until 1993, Israel only had one television station. But since then, the home entertainment scene in the Holy Land has made serious headway. In fact, Vanity Fair has just published an article about all the Israeli series being picked up by Hollywood, and not only for remakes. That's right. Well, here with the scoop is ILTV's Nittany Manson. Nittany, welcome to the studio. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi. That's right. So Israel is really slowly becoming a contender in the world of television. Uh, the list of series that are being picked up just keeps growing uh, for some, some for adaptations and some for shows that are almost just being translated and used as is. Okay, but you know, what are some of the examples of these shows? Well, I mean, just to name a few, <laughs> Homeland, a small show with Very not that much show. following, no, tiny, no, no, not many people haven't really it. heard. <laughs> um, it was actually adapted from Israeli Khatufim, uh, and in treatment, an HBO production was taken from an Israeli series with the same name. Never heard of that one. But uh, unlike Homeland, this one, this is one of the shows that was really just translated. The first two seasons, actually, were almost word for word the same as the Hebrew version. Wow. Um, and there are more and more examples all the time. I mean, Netflix will be releasing The Spy, releasing, sorry, The Spy, mm -hmm. about a Mossad agent starring Sasha Baron Cohen right, later this month. Right, we talked about that last week. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then there's Euphoria, Euphoria, I heard, right? Right, right, Euphoria, a teen drama that's really gaining popularity in the States. And just last month, HBO released Our Boys, a miniseries about the kidnapping yeah. and murder of three Israeli boys at the hands of Hamas. And Israelis are a little bit up in arms it's, about that, but right. it is an it's Israeli a production. It's a controversial so. series, to say Welcome the least. Welcome to Israel. Everyone's uh, fighting about something, sure. right? But I am going to stop you there because I feel like, Nittany, I feel like you could keep listing these yeah. shows for yeah. quite a while. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the list just goes on. Uh, and a lot of people don't really realize that many of their favorite shows are actually remakes of popular Israeli hits. Okay, so what is it about these Israeli shows that has Hollywood so interested? I mean, compared to the States, Israel is fairly new to this, right? Yeah, uh, but that's exactly the point, Natasha. I mean, American TV is nearly everywhere, and Israel is no exception. And so when Israeli writers are coming up with new shows, they really need to think outside the box to attract local audiences, especially when you put yourself up next to these huge budget right. American shows that have a large team with creators and really anything they need. Uh, you have to take your small show that, let's face it, doesn't really have that much money uh, and figure out a way to stand out. All right, well, I'm definitely going to start watching some more, uh, some more Israeli shows, especially if yeah. I can see them before they get popular in the States. <laughs> yeah, that's what's crazy about it. A lot of these shows, I don't actually yeah. watch them myself, and then I hear about them from friends abroad, exactly. which is... Right, just, right. And actually, yeah. a lot of them are even on Netflix now mm -hmm. um, with subtitles, of course, so you yeah. can catch those Israeli ones in Hebrew. Good way to learn Hebrew and English. Thanks for joining us, Nittany. <laughs> My pleasure. All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast now. Tonight should be partly cloudy and comfortable with a low of 77 or 25 degrees Celsius, and then tomorrow will once again be more of the same. Uh, we'll see highs at around 88 or 31 degrees Celsius. And that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.53 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please subscribe to ILTV on Facebook and on Instagram. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kierczyk. Thank you so much for watching.